right, well, yeah, thanks everyone for showing up on a early morning on Wednesday of RSA. Uh, pretty excited to have this topic and have a discussion with you as well, so please start thinking about questions in hand. We'll make sure to have time at the end for those. I'm very lucky to be joined with a phenomenal panel right here to discuss one of the growing concerns across the, the CISO community, and then as well as you know, greater discussion going on in the legal community about where all of this will evolve. And so I'm joined today at the farthest end, Anne-Marie Zellmoyer. She's the CSO of SciCognito. In the middle, we have Jamil Jaffer, who is the founder and executive director of NSI, and Kathy Wong, CISO at SVCI. And so we're integrating legal perspectives, CISO perspectives together. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't, as you can imagine. Um, so we're hopefully going to have a, a good discourse on this. And as you can imagine, a lot of this discussion really was sparked through a, you know, a series of different cases that were popping up over the last year where some CISOs were found uh, accountable for how they handled the, the data breach. And each of those have different circumstances. We've also seen whistleblower concerns. Uh, we've had discussions about uh, resource constraints. Does a CISO have the access to the C-suite and the, the ear of the executives and the board? All sorts of those kinds of concerns are just growing. And so what we're gonna discuss is both that shifting policy landscape and then what the CISOs can do on their end to help prepare for that and especially as we think about where it might be evolving going forward. And so what I'd like to do is first just kick off and hear the different perspectives from each of our, our fabulous panel members. And so maybe Anne-Marie, you wanna kick off a little bit and just talk a little bit about what you're seeing out there as far as what shifts have been occurring in behavior, um, what kind of conversations that you're hearing out there, any kind of concerns or opportunities you might be coming across. It's a very big question. You know, <clears throat> when some of these events started happening in the news, how many, how many CISOs do I have here in the uh, bench? All right, and how many aspiring, like this is your goal? Don't do it. <laughs> Don't I'm, say that. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, no, no. Oh we, need, we need yes, good we people need in the ranks. You, you <laughs> stay in the game. You, you know, this, is, this session is for you. Um, <laughs> so for my fellow Americans. Um, I feel like there was a lot of apprehension the first, with the first big headline you know, about a class action lawsuit against a CISO and the CEO, and then the CEO uh, was exempt from that class action lawsuit. And many of us were sitting there going, oh God, what is this gonna mean for us? And then we had another trial with a criminal liability that happened, and I think it started to really really make us assess our own risk profile. You know, we spend every day, every waking hour trying to defend a business and an infrastructure and do the right thing from their risk tolerance and we forget to think about the implications of our own. So we saw renegotiating of, of uh, contracts, trying to get DNO insurance, definitely folks preparing for um, making sure that they had legal representation going into negotiations for a new role, right? Should they switch companies? And I don't think that that um, was really on top of mind prior to those events, particularly because, um, you know, in, in recent years and even now, the CISO, even though it's a chief title, wasn't all, you know, isn't usually in the C-suite. You know, so you didn't necessarily, I mean, I met a lot of colleagues that had no idea what DNO insurance was, right? We're talking about what that is right now, actually, well, just to kick it off, because <laughs> yeah. I think that term will come up a lot, yeah. and perhaps not everyone in the audience may know what that is. Yeah, so um, it's a liability insurance given to executives to help uh, protect you from these types of things, from you know, certain decisions and stuff, but there are different levels to that. Right, as I used to be on a public board, so I had DNO insurance. I'm part of the C-suite, I have DNO insurance. But if you don't have that going in or you're a couple layers down or what have you, you may think that you're exempt from that if you're not part of a C-suite. And this precedent has shown that, it's, that that's just not the case. Great, thank you. And, then, and Kathy, are you saying something similar from your perspective? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's a really difficult situation because when you're a CISO, it depends on what kind of company you're a CISO at, right? So if it's a pre-IPO company, cloud native, SaaS, um, you may not have DNO coverage by default. You're gonna ask, 
And general counsel or chief legal officer might tell you, yeah, I mean, your title is CISO, but in the HR database, you're kind of like senior director level, maybe VP level, you're not really an officer, right? So if you're in that kind of situation, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And the other thing is that only 25% of CISOs out there in the field today actually have DNO coverage, right? So the majority of CISOs do not. So consider yourself lucky if you're in that 25% but you may try to negotiate and it may not happen. So with the recent events, it's caused a lot of anxiety among CISOs because we're very much in demand for our jobs, but then you know, many of the jobs do not cover it. And by the way, DNO does not cover you if you are found guilty of anything, right? It's more like the defense funds. Yeah. <clears throat> no, thanks, Mitch. And from some to the round tables I've been at, heard they mentioned that it sent a chill throughout the community when there was the first uh, guilty verdict cast out there. I was wondering, Jamila, on the, on the legal front, yeah. what, what's been, has there been a chill through not the legal community or what, what, what is going on there in, in response to uh, this, this series of different kinds of events focusing on breach accountability? Yeah, you know, so, so um, to the extent that folks haven't been following it, um, you know, the, the CISO of Uber uh, Joe Sullivan, the former CISO of Uber, uh, was accused um, and found guilty in federal court um, of, in, of obstructing FTC proceedings against Uber um, and misprison of a felony. That's essentially, you know, it, 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 what this came around about was a 2014-2015 series of data breaches involving millions of Uber records um, and the attempt to, uh, according to the federal government, to hide uh, the fact of the breach um, in a uh, you know, in the bug bounty program, essentially, in the, in the, um, in the sort of program that Uber had uh, for reporting of vulnerabilities and the like. And, you know, it's, it's kind of astounding because this is the first time we've seen a, a chief information security officer accused of a federal crime and ultimately convicted by a jury. Um, and he'll, you know, go to jail or serve some amount of time as a result. Um, and I think this, this resulted in a, in a significant shock, not just within the CISO community, um, as you've heard from my colleagues here, uh, within the legal community, because nobody thought that the federal government would bring charges like this, uh, much less successfully take them to trial and win at trial. And you know, this was this was part of the larger challenges that were going on at Uber at the time, right? You had Travis Kalanick as the CEO, right? There were a lot of there there have been a lot of newspaper stories. You can all go read them um, uh, about the way that Uber was managed at the time, but. You know, the real challenge here is that you're holding a person who was seeking to protect the data records of their customers, right? At the end of the day, what Joe Sullivan did, like it or, or don't like it, agree, disagree, whether he should have done it or not, been more candid with the federal government was, he was trying to get access to the records and ensure they didn't make it out publicly and pay a certain amount of money to get it off the table. Was he trying to protect his own liability? Was he trying to protect the company? Doesn't matter. The point was, as a, in, in terms of privacy and security, right, the, the, the customers of Uber were, Uber were better off because of what the CISO did, and he's gonna to go to jail. So you know what else I um, wanted to mention that I've seen different, and I think this is a positive change, is that you get into a situation as a CISO or a CSO, and you're responsible, right, for securing the company. You're responsible for building these defenses. That term of responsibility is now changing mm -hmm. on what the implications of that mean. So. So I've seen, and I think, again, I think this is a good thing, I've seen good folk walk away from companies or situations that are not properly investing in security because they're thinking to themselves, am I gonna put myself in the situation where I cannot do my job with the proper diligence, with the proper resources, and what is that going to mean for me? What risk am I taking? So they're having these conversations with CEOs, with boards, on what it's gonna mean if they say no, if they're under-resourced. And they're making choices now to move to a place that will take security seriously, where they can accept a level of, of risk on how to perform. Whereas before, you know, you might just get frustrated and be like, okay, I'll ask for budget next year. Everybody feels that you know, we don't necessarily have enough. 
right? But now it's a different context and we're having conversations on, you're asking me to really foot the bill here on risk, not just professionally, but personally. And that opens up a greater discussion, I think, with the board and the rest of the C-suite that can move things forward. You know, thanks for that. And for those conversations to happen, it also is really important to understand what that data breach liability landscape looks like, which in the US at least has about 54 different data breach notification laws. And so to stay on top of that becomes extraordinarily difficult. And so just, Jimo, where do you think that is going? So if, for these discussions as they're going on at the board level increasingly, yeah. What should they expect to happen on the on this policy landscape or the legal landscape for so they can stay on top of that, prepare for wherever it's going next? Do we see consolidation? Yeah, I mean, look, I think there is an effort afoot um, in Congress. It has been for a while. It hasn't been successful yet uh, to create a federal data breach standard um, that will then ultimately, uh, you know, preempt all these state laws and create at least one national standard. You know, most there were a lot of folks in industry who were opposed to data breach notification laws create an additional regulatory footprint. Um, but now I think the desire is there for a standard across the country so you're not dealing with 54. The problem, of course, is you've also got you know, 10 different agencies of the federal government, all of whom have regulatory authority, the SEC on one side, the FCC on the other. You know, you've got regulations coming out potentially from the FTC, from CISA. You've got the new notification law for critical infrastructure that Congress passed. None of these are harmonized. And now this, the new cyber strategy from the White House talks about harmonization, make, puts an emphasis on it, but then you talk to the regulators and they're all like, well, you know, my regulation's the better one, so we're gonna continue to do that. And so there's definitely an effort afoot to harmonize, whether it'll be successful and whether we can, you know, effectively expect that, that's a much harder question. Operationally, for the CCOs who are doing it for real, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare to deal with, right? So you gotta you deal need with your, your lawyers own all the time. cipher. You yeah. need your own cipher. <laughs> it's yeah. like a decoder ring, yeah. you know, on all of these things. And you guys spend more time with your lawyers, which of course, Look, I, I love my lawyers. Wow. We're, we're like, we're, we're as a recovering people. lawyer, you know, I appreciate that. No, I, I lock arms with my lawyer. We go. are attached to the hip. Yeah. I mean, that's the key is to get, <laughs> is to get a lawyer who's, who's moving the ball in the right direction for you. Yeah. you know? And is that normal? I mean, Kathy, do you also see closer relationships with, with the lawyers and then general counsel? Or, or is it? Is I can it? speak for myself. I really try to develop a good relationship with the legal team when I join a company because Every single company has different policies or processes on when to loop in legal when there's a security incident or something else that involves decisions like that. So part of it is getting a really good relationship put together. The other one is educating, right? As a CISO, I definitely want to make sure that the general counsel and I are on the same page. And when there's a security incident, how do we go about looping them in? And do we start labeling different Slack channels or emails or content with certain headers? Um, there's different ways to do that in different orgs. The reason why this is so important is because you don't ever want to try to hide or sweep anything under a rug as a CISO because that's going to be a total disaster. And the sooner you can bring company senior officers in, the better, right? So now there's more awareness. There's a, a, a racy <coughs> matrix where you call in the right people at the right time. And none of this is anything you wanna be figuring out after an incident has occurred. So one of the first things you should do is develop this process and this communications and this messaging I would say within the first 30 days of you joining a company as a CISO. Great, thank you. And you know, as we've gone through and seen some of these shifts, have there been any unanticipated changes you've seen, especially in, in defenses, it's perhaps in the areas of you know, information sharing? Are we seeing more or less information sharing? Are we seeing you know, more or less public-private sector collaboration and, and so forth? What have you seen that either you know, perhaps is an unexpected externality of some of these cases. I'll maybe start with you, Kathy. Yeah, sure. So definitely share information. Those of us that are CISOs usually come from backgrounds where we probably are used to sharing information in threat intel sharing communities, right? Like you all know about threat intel. We've already been primed 
to understand that sharing information and working with law enforcement or other federal authorities is a good thing because we have to work together in order to take down the bad actors out there. So this is second nature to us. That way, when we come into an organization, we should already foster that kind of understanding and that sort of collaboration with the other executive team members. Be Amory. <clears throat> so I, I definitely think that information sharing is is probably hardened because again you want that audit trail. You know, before you you know, I, I think there was a tendency to maybe be a little lax in the risk register or maybe not have um, your exception process really baked in or even audited in a way uh, that you're you're monitoring collective risk, right? Like how many times do we say, okay, here's our policy exception process. If it's low, medium, blah, 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 and you end up with like 100,000 policy exceptions and nobody is looking at that from a escalated risk perspective, right? They're just like, oh, I have one here, one here, and then, but you have 10 risks now that rise to the level of, you know, something you have to pay attention to. So I see, more um, focus on flushing out those processes before maybe going into more tech to make sure that they have the auditability and the accountability in place and um, that people are accountable for those decisions to not remediate, to put something off, to maybe, uh, you know, if they say, I'm, I'm not going to fix this bone for however long because it's not accessible or name your 900 excuses that they give us not to fix something, you know, <laughs> to write that down and then have that physically signed off and reviewed so that you can say, I did my job. My job is to make sure that you have an informed decision. Whoever owns the business process, it's their right to make that decision. And I'm supposed to help enable you to make the right decision and I want to make sure that that's recorded. So I think that's another shift that I think is positive, but um, you know, folks are still you know, trying to find ways to make that practical and not ruffle feathers at the same time. I want to actually stand that for one second, because um, you both have mentioned processes as, as a key component and things that are shifting internally within organizations. So maybe, can you maybe dive a little bit deeper into, have you seen some best practices for those processes that can help either bridge a communication gap um, help with the, like the documentation that you just talked about, or are there key things that you have been learning throughout this process for the shifts that you'd recommend for the audience? Okay. I can start. So when you're developing a process, there's two things that are key to this being successful. The first thing is really good communication over communication even, because some of the companies out there are hybrid, remote, right? Maybe if it's even in person, you might not see someone on the team very often. So making sure that you over communicate the messaging multimodal ways. So like maybe in two Slack channels, over email, at an all hands meeting, say it four or five times and you'll probably reach about 80% of your audience that you wanna reach. Not 100, <laughs> but 80. And that's pretty good. The other thing is Besides the, uh, the communication style, you also have to be very clear that you have consensus and agreement upon like talking to the executive team. So when you put this process together, whether it is a, a matrix or some process, you want to communicate that in advance with each stakeholder on there. Make sure that there's agreement that yes, I, I definitely can be accountable for this or I can be informed on this or consulted on this. Because if you don't do that, when it's time to publish all that information and communicate it out, you're gonna get pushed back right away. And that would be a mistake, right? So you haven't actually closed the loop and gotten the agreement. So, um, so I've been in eight industries in the past 26 years. I've been at huge enterprises, I was at MasterCard prior to coming to SciCognito. I've been in startups. I've been in government. Um, I've been in consulting. 
seen a lot of things. Here are the commonalities. It doesn't matter what tool you use. Certainly if you're at a certain size and you can have an automated tool that will send and remind you know, that, that an exception is expiring or you know, do automated review and data, that's great. But if you're, but most of the time, even the big guys are using Excel. So don't be upset about that if you've got to start in Excel. What, what will make it successful is if you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the teams that are going to have to justify their exception. Because that immediately, unless you approach it the right way, is gonna feel antagonistic. They're gonna feel like, oh, what do you mean? I have to have my EVP sign off on this. Well, I have to give a date to our mediation because, you know, I bet pretty much the majority of the people in this room, the exception process or your risk register probably isn't, it's probably has the, the same amount of hygiene as your CMDP, right? And the level of detail in there is probably just as fantastic, right? So we've all got work to do. And they might feel defensive because you're asking them to give more detail and Frankly, they probably haven't thought it through because they, in the past they've just been able to give an exception at sign off and they forget about it. And now we're in a position to be like, tell me why you need this. Tell me how much friction. What is your plan to remediate? Oh, you're not going to remediate? Then it goes over here and you need this type of level of SIVA. So you need to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations to walk them through that versus sending out an edict and then help them write it. Right? Let make sure they know what their role is here in accepting that risk, right? And what it means should that risk come to fruition. Right. And then, you know, you be a partner and you have that sort of advisor, counselor role with them. And that will that will improve and build bridges which will turn into lifelines for both of you. But you know, what tool you have, as long as it's got the amount of detail you've got a numbering system, you've got some sort of process to review and uh, you know, on a certain cadence, that part is fine and there's lots of stuff out there, but it's that relationship piece that's gonna make the difference um, in this shift. No, thank you. And now turning a bit to the, to the, on the legal side for unanticipated consequences potentially, um, on public-private sharing, collective defense, uh, you know, Post shields up, we saw a lot more information sharing occurring, I think in some ways unprecedented levels. What, what are you seeing, Jamil, on, on, as a res result of this? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, the, the Ukraine war and the shields up campaign, the establishment of JCDC at CISA, these are all positive moves by the government to try and get more of that public-private interaction going. There's no way the government can do this on its own, right? The private sector has got to be leading on this effort, as you all uh, know day to day. But what I think is interesting about this is we're also in, in entering an increasingly regulatory environment, right? We see the National Cybersecurity Strategy making clear that the government's intent is to regulate this space. And as a general matter, I'm very skeptical of regulations in this domain. I don't think the government can keep up. I don't think um, it makes sense for the government to tell industry how to, how to protect itself in the cyber domain. But there is an upside to all of this. The upside to all of this is that for all of you, every time the government does something new or tries to regulate in this domain, your board is engaged, they're, with, they're where it's happening, your entire C-suite is on it, and they're gonna have to respond. So now, whereas before you had to go beg, borrow, and plead for budget, now it's a key part of it, right? And as an investor in the cybersecurity domain today, right, this is an upside for all of us, because now we're gonna get better, more effective tools, you're gonna have budget to spend and, 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 and go acquire it, because the government is requiring you to do it. So, I'm skeptical of regulation, but it's a win for CISOs and a win for security writ large if in fact we're able to get to the right place on this. So there's an upside and downside, I think, you know, playing out in this new environment. Well, true, you have that, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs in cyber, right? You've got the, you must do because I done told you you have to, right? Whether it's from reg or compliance or whatever, I mean, use that. Yeah. Mm, don't fight it, use it. So Jimmy, what, what would right potentially look like? So if you were to advise policymakers, legislators yeah. on what data breach liability could look like to be both supporting collective defense without yeah. negative externalities or minimizing, there's always going to be yeah. some offset. I mean, look, I'm a believer in using incentives, right? using the carrot rather than the stick as a first order matter. So if you can align industries' incentives with the governments, which is everyone wants better cybersecurity. So you know, give them incentives to invest in, in more cybersecurity resources, tools, capabilities, personnel. That's a win for everyone, right? It increases your salaries, increases your marketability. 
um, and increases the overall level of cybersecurity. If the government's going to come in with regulations, though, the best way to do it, and, and with, with sort of the stick, and the best way to do it, in my view, is a collaborative process with industry. And there are elements of that in the new strategy from the White House, right? They're talking about coming to industry, developing best practices, and then use, you know, implementing those with, with the regulatory stick. Will it work? You know, we've seen in the energy industry, it's okay, right? And so maybe that's a model. Um, but government coming in and thinking it knows better on technology and imposing regulations with stiff consequences is ridiculous. And so hopefully they're able to get a more collaborative process going. That's what I think good looks like if you're going to have it. But I'd start with carrots and incentives first. Have you seen some level of engagement starting to increase? Because we've also know that, you know that there's been you know, rocky engagement from time to time between the security community and the government. Are we, where is that trending right now? Have you? I mean, I, 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 I want to hear what Kathy and, and you know, and Anne-Marie think because, I mean, you guys are on the front lines of it, but from my perspective, it has to get better because the reality is we are on, I mean, if you look around the globe, what's happening in, in Russia, Ukraine, the threats against Taiwan, the instability in, in Africa, nation state actors are coming after us left and right. And we are going to be on the front lines of this and the private sector is going to have to make a choice, right? Are these, are these major companies global companies or are they American companies? That choice is coming, and it's not going to be fun. But, I mean, how are you seeing it on the front line? Well, I can tell you personally, I was invited more than once, more than twice, to comment and review the national cyber strategy. Yeah. You know, with you and I together, and then um, another time with other groups um, and, and individually. So I think that's, that's positive. I'm regularly on the Hill, as you are, uh, engaging just as part of you know, who, who we are in community and how we love to serve the community. And same thing with the UK government. So I think that um, we're making changes and headways into trying to connect and, and not raise voices, join voices, right, in order to make things a little bit better, but also to make them practical. Mm. And I think that there, you know, we, we're bringing, you know, staffers to DEF CON. Right? We've done that for years. We've, we bring them to ShmooCon. We bring them to RSA. We, we have lunches with them. We sit and partner and, and do a lot of education days. And I'm seeing more, um, I'm seeing more groups to, to try to operationalize the information sharing. But I also think that because it's so uh, dissected, is that the right word? You know, like fragmented, mm. that we lose, we lose the obviously the coordination to make things better and more strategic, but I think the first, the first, you know, went out the gate is that it's happening. It might be happening sloppily, you know, it might be happening in a sort of kind of disoriented way, but at least it's happening and then we can build that to make it better. So I do see a, a change. I think those are some really good points. As a security practitioner for over 20 years, there is one thing that I, I could say I probably learned better than anything else, which is that if there's anything that we need people to, to do, it needs to be actionable, right? So any policy needs to be enforceable and any process needs to be actionable because if it's not, then we're just talking and we're writing, but then we're not seeing any real positive results out of it. So this is very true for security alerts, security incidents. I would like to see it applied to, you know, legal matters and, and security related legal matters. So breaches and sometimes I think in the security community, we feel like there's a bit of a example making out of certain people. Would this same thing have happened, same outcome with you know, sentencing or whatever have happened in this case if this person was a different person, if they didn't have a background in legal? Who knows, right? So for us, this is very confusing. It's like, why would you make an example out of this person? Is that really long-term enforceable? So. Well, but I do say, now, I'm, uh, the other thing you don't know about me is I, I'm an accountant, was, and once you're an accountant, you're always an accountant, and I'm old. So um, when Sarbanes-Oxley came around, who remembers Sarbanes? Who remembers Enron? Who was there? Who was in the room? We still have scars, right? We still emotionally eat over those experiences. 
But what happened that came out of that was criminal liability for a CFO or a controller, right? If you did not um, properly protect the integrity of your accounting and financial systems. And for years, for years, I've been saying that's gonna happen here in the cyber world and here it's coming, right? And do I think it's a bad thing? You know, I don't like the, um, you know, uh, the specific targeting of folks, but I think that having that accountability raises the profile of the function, right? The CFO is the second most powerful person in that company, and part of it is because they have an extraordinary liability attached to them. To have another officer level, you know, um, where that's applied to, it's gonna renegotiate that position, I think, because you don't have that for a CIO, you don't have that for the CMO, right, or the COO, but you have it specifically for these risk functions, and I, I, I think we can leverage that as a force for good, or we can kick and scream and still have to comply with it. And so given that we're likely heading down that road, what steps, like actual steps, do you recommend security officers, CSOs, CISOs, that they should take to protect themselves for, for what is bound to be coming? Um, maybe Kathy, do you want to start? So, <coughs> you know, we've been thinking about more than ever, definitely advocate for that P&O inclusion, okay? Do it, if the answer is no, then it's no, but really fight for it. And the other thing that you can do is employment contracts. You have more leverage at the time of your job offer than any other time during your tenure at the company. That's your opportunity right at the very beginning to negotiate for terms that will work favorably for you. So that includes things like, you know, triggers and severance and things like that, but also indemnity clauses, right? You, you do not want to set yourself up where you're going to be in a position to really suffer consequences. You're gonna do everything you can to not do that. The other thing is probably incorporate some sort of entity like an LP and put all of your assets in there. That way it doesn't directly tie to your direct bank account, right? And, and that's another thing that people will do to try to decrease liability. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you legal advice there, but I can say that many of us who are CISOs have done one or two or maybe all of those things that I just said since the whole Jill Sullivan case. Oh, thank you, how about you, Amory? So I, 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 don't, I don't want to scare you. Okay. But you and will. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm very giving. Um, none of this is to scare you. It's to prepare you. It's to help provide some thought into your own attack surface and your own liability and your own risk profile. You know, like I said in the beginning, we spend so much time protecting others. You want, you want to take some, some dedicated time over the next few months and really evaluate your own position. You know what they say, and this is a human behavior, right? They say that we spend more time planning our annual vacations than we do our retirement. Y'all know that's true. When was the last time you looked at your 401k or your investment strategy to be able to retire? You don't have to nod heads, because I already know, right? So, and many of you still don't have you know, like you know, the, the estate stuff and all that plan. Like that part has to, you, you owe yourself the amount of due diligence and the investment in strategy at least once a year that you give to everybody else. That means you wanna make sure that you have good counsel on retainer. It's worth it. You know, $1,000, $500 to do an annual checkup for yourself and your family or whoever, it's worth it. Make sure that you're doing that. And for crying out loud, be choosy on who you give your time to because everybody here is valuable. So don't put yourself in a position where you are uncomfortable with the ethics 
or the decision or the direction of the company you keep and the company that you work for, right? There's, there's, you know, you may have to take a certain amount of risk for a certain amount of time, but give yourself the gift that you give to everybody else so that you can make an informed decision. You wanna be in a high risk situation for a year to make you know, a certain amount of money, make sure you're making a conscious decision and you have compensating controls <laughs> to help manage that risk for yourself. No, that's great advice. And anything you wanna add on, Jamil? No, I mean, I think, that, I think that covers it really well. I mean, uh, you know, it's already been said, but build a good relationship with, with your internal legal teams and build good relationships with the government on the outside, right? Mm -hmm. that, those, those relations can really benefit you um, when it comes time to go back to them for either their assistance or to report something. And so knowing who to, who to talk to and having, having built that relationship over time, internally and externally, is of real value. Okay, great. We've got a couple minutes left, so we're going to go to our lightning round. Yep. And hopefully everyone will start thinking about some questions for this great group. But we'll do one real quick, and then we'll go to questions. So the title of, the, of our panel, The Buck Stops Where? Where does the buck stop in your Security mind? Security is everybody's job, and that's what I'm going to say. All right. It's <laughs> shared liability. I mean, look, I think, I think CISO should report directly to the CEO and the board, and so I think, I think the buck should stop at the board. And boards need to have cyber expertise, and if that's not happening in your company, you should demand it internally. You should demand your role be reporting the CEO and the board, and the board needs to have cyber expertise. Yeah, I, I think if a CISO has done their job and been transparent and communicated and built relationships, the buck definitely stops with the board and the CEO. And are we seeing that happening? No. Well, I, I report to the CEO and the board, so it, it can happen. Yeah. You know, you can be choosy about what you, what you want to do. Okay, great. And we'll, we'll go get a question right here. Yeah, so, so I, I'm curious. The, um, you know, for instance, with the Joe Sullivan uh, conviction, and, and there's a bigger question, but did, did his conviction and that action make Uber security posture any better? And the other kind of question is, what is the trickle-down implication of uh, a CISO being knocked back on their heels by regulatory or legal action or threats of liability? Like, does the company get more secure? Uh, uh, or does it not? Okay, now so repeat the question for folks that may not have heard it. Um, talking about the Uber case, uh, has it led to a better security posture within the company? And then as well, has there been a trickle effect, trickle down effect of greater security working its way throughout the entire organization? So, who'd like to take that? Uh, look, no, obviously it did make Uber security better immediately. Um, might, might the threat of regulation or the threat of liability uh, make people work harder? It might. Is it going to be effective? I don't think so. I think, I think this is what Joe Sullivan prosecution was a mistake. I think it's, I think it's, it's a nightmare for CISOs. Um, and you've heard the, the, <coughs> you know, the get DNO insurance on the like. So, you know, net net, can the government regulate effectively in this space? I don't think so, but they're going to. So now we've got to figure out how to make it better. They're going to try. They're going to try. How many of you use your influence with the chief legal officer or general counsel to demand that your in-house counsel or, or assigned external counsel actually have cybersecurity knowledge and capabilities. Uh, I've worked with a lot of clients where the legal department, they're like, oh, privacy and security are the same thing, give it to the HR lawyer because that's where our personal data is. And you often don't have the expertise. And as you said, Sarbanes Oxley bred an entire generation of lawyers focused on one single regulation. And yet right now people are relying really on generalists just to give the internal advice waiting until you need outside counsel to defend you against a federal claim before you can um, really set your actions straight? So I don't demand uh, those things. I preference them. But here's the reality. I know where my knowledge ends and where it begins. And when I said that security is everybody's job, it truly is. It, in the company that I'm at now, it's, it's a startup and it's small. And with MasterCard, we had all kinds of domains uh, of lawyers. But even then, they weren't as strong in security as I was. So I always had to make up the gap, and that's how it should be. I don't expect them to know everything. I expect them to partner with me and me to partner with them so that together we can round out that knowledge. And that means that we have to have a mutual respect on how to strategize and make sure we come to what is the outcome that we want. Then you use your brain, I use my brain, and we come up with those two things to get that outcome. Yeah, so my question is centered around uh, if you're not 
reporting directly to the board or the CEO and you're going through another C-suite level, particularly let's just say general counsel as an example, um, while there's a, a great benefit to, to the relationship and the dynamic there, um, I've seen throughout my career sometimes uh, that uh, information can be shielded or um, articulated differently um, to the executive team or to the board uh, when reporting through uh, another C-level uh, entity. Um, what advice would you have for CISOs that aren't at that officer level um, when there are you know, things that are implicating uh, or uh, you know, to the company or uh, significant risk to the company and you want to ensure that that reaches you know, the highest level within the organization and it's articulated effectively. Jamie, Kathy, want to, your thoughts on that? Um, I really couldn't hear the question, so, so someone else. Perhaps, if, perhaps if, someone is, if they're not able to report directly to the CEO or to the board, are there any recommendations that you might have for them that yeah. since they're not at that process yet? Okay, <coughs> thank you for that. Uh, so you usually, most CISOs don't report directly to the CEO. That's definitely in the smaller percentages. Most will report to like a, another officer, like a CTO or COO, or um, rarely maybe legal officer, that sort of thing. So my advice is to definitely, you know, lobby for as high of a reporting structure as possible. And when that's not possible, all of those things that I mentioned earlier, the, the LP, the indemnity clauses, the employment contract, um, DNO, if you can, right? It's very difficult for a lot of people to get all of that, but get as many of those as possible, right? And then deliver results. If you deliver results, that's gonna be the best way for you to continue to lobby for the security role to be top line business function, which means reporting to a CEO directly. So I would also do your due diligence on who the board is, where they come from. Remember, I spent the first decade in business, so I speak that language really well. Um, but, and if you're in a public company and you haven't read the 10K, that's probably a problem. You know, so you wanna make sure you do that because you wanna know how the business operates, what's important to the business, how they make money so that you can translate what you feel is important in that effort to enable the business so that you can communicate that to the board. And I will tell you, even when you, even, and I was on a public board also, so even in that case, things are gonna be shielded. Let me be real with you. It's always gonna be sort of like, not as bad as you think it's gonna be. I mean, read a, if you read an audit report, it's always in this soft, flutterly, beautiful language that you, know, you really gotta pierce through in order to see what's going on. So you, you make sure that you provide all of the detail to the highest level that you have, and then they're accountable for cleaning it, because you've done your due diligence by telling what you need to say and what you feel is important to the audience that you have been privy to. And they, you know, they are responsible for making sure that they provide the lens back to you on what the board is interested in today. And over time, as you build that credibility, you can provide you know, more uh, candid conversations. I mean, I've had board members reach out to me personally in other companies and say, can you you know, I have a question, can you coach me on that? And that's because I gave them what they wanted to know in the first place. I didn't shove it down their throat, right? Because they weren't ready for that. It takes time, but as long as you have articulated anything scary or pressing, right, to the right folks, that stuff will handle. And I assure you, you're, it's not, security is not the only department that um, doesn't get all of their stuff up to the board level. Just one quick follow-up to that is, do you guys feel that a, a CYA file provides any uh, shielding or uh, liability coverage for a CISO, if you know what I mean? <laughs> Cover your A. I mean, I mean, look, I think that it, it makes sense to document your concerns, but you should document, as Anne-Marie said, in a way that's, that's, that's proactive for the business, right? You're more likely to get success that way 
Um, and either way, you're going to be documenting your, your concerns, right? So whoever you're reporting to, tell them what your, what your issue is, tell them why it matters for the business and why you think the, the recommended course is the right balance for the business in terms of cost, expense, and revenue. And, and make yourself part of the business team. Instead, of, instead mm -hmm. of looking at it like, I'm the person who's gonna come in and warn you like Cassandra about all the problems, right? Like, I'm gonna tell you what the real problems are, I'm gonna tell you why it matters to your bottom line and helps the business, and why you should make this case for me to the board, right? And that's documenting the same way as having a CYA file, right? But that's a way it's more likely to get you success and get, your, get, get the job done. Yeah, and the reality is, folks, loss isn't bad. There is a certain amount of risk tolerance that every company will have to take on loss. So, you know, we, don't, we are not here to secure That's to 100%. You've got to, so aside from the legal officer, you really got to make friends with that CFO because they're the ones that are setting the risk tolerance in dollars, right? So if you're not managing and building security to that, then you're probably either over engineering or you're taking, you know, you're, you're at risk for taking things really personally. And we all do that. Thank I'll you guys for your time. Other questions and before we go. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding speed and vendor responsibility. Now, as you know, in a lot of these cases, like reacting to a ransomware incident, things happen in seconds. So it's very hard for people at different levels to work together. So do you think it's just the responsibility of the company to set up those structures, those communication channels ahead of time so that when such an incident happens, there doesn't need to be something that needs to be communicated or discussed, people just act? Or, and, and also, like, what level of responsibility do you think the technology solutions vendors should have in regards to you know, dealing with such things? Should they accept more liability than do at the moment? I mean, I think if you're gonna build a product, it better work. <laughs> I mean, let's make sure that we, <laughs> you know, if you're, like, you're not selling snake oil, I don't like that. But you've gotta drill the process. Even in huge organizations that have drills, tabletops every month, they're still going to fumble because that human emotion, that adrenaline is going to take over. And if you're not the calm voice in the storm, been there, done that to guide these people, it's still, you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're still going to get frustrated with the response. So yes, you have to drill. You have to drill on it. You have to assume that it's going to happen and you know what to do. But you also have to know that people are going to get freaked out when it does. And you have to be that shepherd when they do it. And practice how you play. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, decision making under, under uncertainty is hard and so it's important, to, it's important mm -hmm. to game it out, right? And you can make it fun and interesting and exciting. I mean, there's value in doing that, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, the nightmare that everybody has to do every month or every six months or, you know, like cyber training, like, oh God, another, I mean, you can make the, you can my gamify this stuff. My tabletops are amazing. Yeah, yeah you can Everybody it. wants to come yeah, to my exactly. tabletop. All right, I want to make sure we get another question in or two. Over here. Sure, yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, in her panel discussion with Chris Krebs on uh, Monday afternoon, um, Deputy AG Lisa Monaco kind of wanted to have partnership and collaboration between um, organizations and the DOJ in responding to an incident. Um, the lawyers in the room would probably tell you they would exercise caution there. Um, so what advice would you give to CISOs and organizations in terms of establishing and managing that relationship with the DOJ moving forward in response to an incident? Yeah. Kathy, do you have thoughts on the DOJ relationship and how private sector um, can manage that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really difficult situation with the, the CISOs. Um, I, I would just say, you know, when you're thinking about helping the process along, it's, it's like you probably will get pushback initially, especially if you're the first CISO that this organization has ever hired. That's where you're gonna see the most resistance. But what I always try to do is tie these security goals to business outcomes, right? So you can say, hey, look, we're gonna do, for example, we're gonna do this tabletop exercise. I know you haven't really done a tabletop exercise before, but this will help us because um, we won't be trying to figure this scenario out for the first time when it happens, which means that we're gonna be slower to respond, and if we're slower to respond, there's all these studies that show that the longer it takes to respond, the higher <coughs> the risk of revenue loss. That's just an example, but you have to come up with these narratives and these stories as the CISO so that you know the rest of the board and, and the executives will go along with it. Yeah. 
Okay, we've only got one minute left. So if it's state your question really fast and yours really fast, we'll see if it can run through. Okay, just quickly, this is less of a question, more of just a statement um, from the insurance industry. I'm an, a former d &O underwriter. Um, just, to, just to reflect back some of the things that you said, that the when you if you when you can articulate the liability as a CISO to your CFO, your CEO, your GC that says this is where my liability is, this is where <coughs> it's going to impact the company. That's where you have a better argument of trying to get your position covered under an DNO insurance policy. And the other issue that you may get pushback from the DNO underwriter is that they're trying to isolate the cybersecurity exposures from the DNO exposures, but when they come to individual action and liability, that's where the DNO policy differentiates itself from cyber. And so I think that you guys are all right in that try to make re um, relationships with the most senior people of the company and explain from a business perspective why that risk ex uh, exists for you personally, and that's where you get a stronger argument to add you to the policy. All right, thanks, and quick. Yeah, so at the beginning of the panel, you mentioned about you know, class actions against CISO as well as um, regulators wanting to make examples out of CISOs. But on the flip side there, the company should be aware that if they throw their CISOs to the wolves, so to speak, they're not gonna be able to fill that spot again. Right. So how yeah. do you see companies backing up or banding behind their um, chief information security officer? I wish I was optimistic in that, but everybody makes decisions that they know aren't right. I mean, it, you know you shouldn't eat a whole box of cookies, but we do it anyway. So yeah. theoretically, you know, you shouldn't do that, but in the time, I, I see some people make desperate decisions. And we unfortunately need to wrap it up right now. But we can address that a bit more outside. I know they need to empty the room now, but we're happy to continue the conversation outside for a minute. Um, but thank you all for showing up and for the great engagement. <laughs>